love our moms. Happy Mother's Day 2020, the one where I was quarantined. Wow, we will never forget that moment, right? Uh, imagine we haven't seen our family. Just want to say, church is a family. That's why we uh, a little bit get uh, uh, upset when government officials think that church is like football, baseball, large gathering of strangers. I just want to say this out. We are not strangers. We are family. Amen. It's not a large gathering of strangers. It's a gathering of God's people. That's why we are called the church. That's why for us just to see each other in a few minutes. I don't know about you. I teared up. I cried just to see those smiling faces and waving of their hands. It sends a message to all of us. We're here and we're going to move on. And we're going to go over to the other side of this. Come on, somebody. Because we have a living hope. Come on, church. We have a living hope. Well, I'm so excited tonight because this is the first time I'm going to preach from the book of Esther. Because this book is very powerful. If you like conspiracy theory, there's conspiracy theory. If you like action, there's action. There's assassination plot. There's assassination plot. There's love story. This is like the ultimate Korean drama. If you, if you like a, a beauty pageant, this is the first Miss Universe called Miss Persia. But here's the amazing thing. Esther lived in a time when God seems absent. It was one of the darkest moments in history when it seems God is absent. Maybe this is what you feel right now in this time of the coronavirus. We don't know when we're going to really open. We don't know about the security of our jobs. We don't know about what's going on in our own family. I heard some story that during this quarantine, it leads to quarreling. There are some couples having a hard time living and having some problems. And it basically, we are all affected of this. And sometimes we wonder, is there hope in the midst of this pandemic? I want to say this to all of us. There is hope when all seems hopeless. Everybody say this with me, living hope. When all seems hopeless. So let me give you the background because this is not a fictionary story. This is not a Disney movie. This is a real story that happened sometime in history. So let me tell you some Discovery Channel moment. So the, cross, the X mark is the temple. There's only temple in Israel. Only one. It's in Jerusalem. The Babylonians attack and they decimated, they burned down the temple. The heart of, of the people of God, their relation to God, their temple was burned to the ground. And some of the young people was taken as captives or prisoners of war, taken to Babylon. As we look at the next slide, you see those Jewish taken to the Babylonian empire. Remember I said a, a while ago that in the Babylonian, they stop worshiping God because they say, how can we sing the song of the Lord if we are away from Jerusalem? And then while they're quarantined, while they were prisoner in Babylon, here comes another foreign power. The Babylonian was captured by Persia. And here comes the Persian uh, uh, riding on their horses. They attack, and this is what you see like a picture of the prisoners of war. And look at the next slide. After that, here comes the Persian Empire. So here's the story now. Persian Empire was a little bit nicer to the Jewish people, unlike the Babylonians. So the Persian Empire said, if you want to go back to home to Israel, that's what you call the remnants, you can go back and rebuild Israel. 
So a lot of people went back to Israel. That's why we see the time of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. But some of the Jews, they decided to stay in Persia. Because they believe their future is much better in Persia than Israel because they don't have homes there, they don't have jobs there, they have no, uh, they have no future there. So they decided to stay in Persia. So here's the story of East Esther living in a foreign land somewhere in Persia. So the question in the book of Esther is this, is it possible to live by faith and hope when my circumstances are completely removed from the dreams that I had in my life. And I think this is also the question that we have in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. Is it still possible for us to live with hope and faith when my circumstances are completely removed from the dreams that I had in my life? Let me tell you, the only two books in the Bible this is a trivia moment. Bible school student, check this out. Did you know there's only two books in the Bible God is not mentioned? The only two books in the Bible, no mention of God, no mention of faith, no mention of worship, no mention of God. The book of Esther and the Song of Solomon. You know, just this week, I checked out the New York Times this is in their newspaper, where is God in a pandemic? And the honest answer is, we don't know. That's what they said. Even non-Christians may find understanding in the life of Jesus. Maybe this is what your question right now. Where is God in the midst of this pandemic? It's frustrating that whenever you drive around, and sometimes the, all of the signs that you see shut down, sorry, we're closed, 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 as if everything is being shut down and we are going down to nothing and all going down because of this. Now there's a book that just came out of this week from John C. Lennox. This is what he said, where is God in a coronavirus world? So if that is your question, that was also the question of Esther during the time. Living in Persia, cannot even practice their belief, no temple, no synagogue. And they are also hiding their nationality. They're not telling their Jewish people because they are being hated and they will be killed for their nationality. So that's why in the book of Esther, Ten chapters, no mention of God. But here's an amazing thing, church. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes we thought that God is absent, but it doesn't mean he's absent because you cannot shut down God. Come on, somebody. God is everywhere. He is omnipresent. He might be silent, but he's not absent. So here's the big idea. Would you please read this aloud with me? Would you type this in? And I hope this will bring hope to all of us today. God is always at work even when it appears he is silent or absent. You know, I've been attending a lot of church online nowadays because there's all over the, the, the social media, the internet, the, the YouTube, and the Facebook. And I look at a different, a lot of churches, and I'm so fired up just to see them sharing the gospel. And I always hear this all over the world. This song is being sang almost in every church online. Even when I don't see it, even though when I don't feel it, you never stop. You never stop working. You're the way maker. You're the promise keeper. Why is that song the top, uh, probably top five song in the time of pandemic? Because we feel as if that God is not here, but he is still working. Amen, somebody. So here's what it means. This, there's a big word in theology I want to teach you tonight or today. It's called providence. Everybody say providence. Uh, miracles is obvious display of God, like cutting of the Red Sea, obvious. Jesus walking on the water, obvious. 
God sending fire from heaven. Oh my gosh, that's obvious. Oh, you see, Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and two fish, obvious. But providence is God's miracle behind the sin. Providence means in some invisible and mysterious way, God governs all things through the normal and the ordinary course of human life. Providence means when God pretends to be hiding on you, when pla God play hide, play hide and seek on you, I like one of the meanings of providence is God is moving behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes that he is, that, that he is behind. You know, right now, while you're watching at this presentation, I'm preaching to 10 people in this building. You know, some people are saying, Pastor, the amazing uh, video presentation, the different angle of uh, the camera, and the different uh, uh, ways of showing it. How many cameramen do you have doing that? And you know what? You don't see it because what you see is just the frame, but you don't see there's only one cameraman. Down here is Brother Raymond, and he will do this. Woo, 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 woo. You don't see that. That's behind the scene. But what he's doing is obvious in the picture. Sometimes God is like that. We don't see it in the picture. But behind the scene, he's moving. He's orchestrating. He's not absent. He's like a director overseeing a film, a story of your life. That is what you call providence. So let's go to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 1. Please hang with me, charisma and fa family and people watching us online. Because I believe there's a message that God gave this in my heart that you want, want you to receive and forever change your life. Because it changed my life too. So here's the story. Everybody read this together. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. That's the name of the king who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Zuza. That is Persia. I want to show you from the map. Just Google Persian Empire 500 BZ. You see this? All of the then known world from India to Kush. Imagine that reigns. It's all under one king. It's all under one leader. His name is King Xerxes. And this king is a party king. Did you know that if you read the book of Esther, it's all about parties, banquets, gathering. Check this out. In chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, in the third year of his reign, he gave banquets for all his nobles and officials, military leaders of Persia, and the nobles and the province of, of the provinces were present for how many days? For a full of hundred. 80 days. Come on, somebody. Six months party. Imagine that. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor of the glory of his majesty. Why? He just wanted to show off his power. He would just want to show off his money and his splendor of his kingdom. I am King Xerxes. I am the king of the world. Six months party. After the six months, there will have another party. It's called the after party for seven days. Check this out. It's in the Bible. Let's look at, this. Let's look at the, the picture. Can we show it on the screen? Let's, when these days were over, the king gave a banquet, this time lasting seven days. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. Open bar. Drink until you drop. Drink with no restriction, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. 
So check this out. While they're all high in spirits and of, of, of the wine, look what happened next. As we, uh, on the seventh day, when King Sersus was in high spirits, if you notice it's not Holy Spirit, okay? It's high spirits from wine. He commanded to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and novels, for she was lovely to look at. You know what the king is doing? He's just trying to show his trophy wife. Look at my beautiful Queen Vashti. Check her out. She is so lovely to look at. So the king called her to come to the party. And Queen Vashti said, no. I don't just want to look, be looked at like a piece of object. Or to be to, to exactly to say this, like a sex object. She did not show up. Queen Vashti said no to her king and yes to her dignity. But here's the problem. Nobody say no to King Circes. And because of that, King Circes made her an example. <sighs> beheaded. So the Queen Vashti beheaded. So of course, because she was so drunk, the king, when he got sober, he realized, oh my gosh, I have no wife. I let my beautiful Queen Vasti be murdered under my own watch. And so the nobles told him, why don't you have a beauty pageant like the Miss Persia 500 BC edition? Parade all the beautiful women in the world. And you choose one to be your wife. And that is not chapter 2. Let's read this together. And after a while, King Xerxes got over being angry. But he kept thinking about what Vashti had done and the law that he had written because of her. Then the king's personal servant said, Your majesty, a search must be made to find you some beautiful young woman. Now here comes another person in the story. Everybody say Mordecai. Everybody say Mordecai. He is a Jew living in Persia, incognito. Nobody knows his identity, just few of some of her, his friends because he's hiding, because Jews during that time are being ostracized and being persecuted. But he lives in Mordecai as a businessman. Mordecai has a niece, orphan. Her name is Esther. Both parents died because of the war, but Mordecai adapted this beautiful girl. So now here comes Esther. Mordecai had a beautiful cousin named Esther whose Hebrew name was Hadassah. Everybody say Hadassah. He raised her as his own daughter after her father and mother died. Everybody say Esther. Everybody say Hadassah. Esther is her Persian name. The name Esther means star. Hadassah is her Hebrew name. So nobody knows Hadassah. They all know this girl as Esther. Why? Look at chapter 10 of chapter 2 of, of verse 10. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. You know what Uncle Mordecai is saying? Hey girl, if you want to win Miss Persia, you cannot use your Jewish name. You cannot use the Hadassah, Malkovich, they will know you're Jewish. Use the, the Persian name Esther. You know, you know, notice if you, if you watch beauty pageant, when they're being paraded, one time I was watching the Miss Universe and say, here comes from the Philippines, my name is Pia Warchbach from the country of the great Philippines. And then, and then my dad was saying, to, she's not original. Is there a Filipino last name 
work bad or <laughs> what you words work bad work bad so so she's half filipina and half german as we all know but back in the day that's a no no and especially if you're jewish so this is what happened to her she did not reveal her jewish name imagine this one year of beauty treatment Imagine all of those contestants, one year, cosmetic, beauty treatment. So during the day, Hadassah or Esther was the favored by God behind the scene. And the king, Xerxes, picked her. The Bible says this, and king loved Esther. More than all the women, she found favor. That's grace and kindness with him and all the young women. So he set the queen's crown on her head and made her queen. Imagine an orphan Hebrew girl became the queen of Persia. As we all know, King Xerxes is a party animal, right? So he threw another party. Now it's called the Esther's Banquet. Chapter 2, verse 18. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's Banquet, for all his nobles and officials. Check that out. Nobles and officials. Only the higher apps, only the who's who of society in Persia to show the new queen. And he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces, distributed gifts with royal liber liberality. Now here comes the bad guy. One of the officials, his name is Haman or Haman. This is a bad dude. This is a thug. This is the number one hater of Jewish people. This is like Japar from Aladdin. If you want some, some, some uh, illustration. This is like Japar from Aladdin, the bad guy. Right? So this is Haman. Now... After these events, King Xerxes honor Haman the Agagite. The bad guy became the second in command, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than the, all the other novels. And all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down, paid honor to Haman, but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Imagine this guy is the number one ego maniac dude. It's like, I'm the best. I'm the champion. Now I'm the second in command. And he asked the king to make a law that whenever he comes, people will bow down and kneel down in honor of Haman. But when he was going out of the king's gate, there was a Jewish guy by the name of Mordecai. But for this man, the only time he bows down is in prayer to the one true God. The only time that he kneels down is to God. He cannot kneel down or bow down to any human being. So when, Mordi, when this guy, Haman, was passing his strutting staff and said, Hey, check me out. And this guy did not even look at him and not bow down acknowledge him. He was so mad. He was so mad at Mordecai that he wanted to kill him just because he was not acknowledged. That's what hatred and anger and bitterness could do to a person. It could lead to plotting of murder. And then Haman realized that this guy is not from Persia. He's Jewish. Now his hatred is not just for Mordecai, for everyone who looked like Mordecai, everyone who looked like a Jew. Church, racism is a 2,500-year problem. Look at what the Bible says. Chapter 3, verse 6, Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, 
he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews. Throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. I showed you on the map. The kingdom of Xerxes is all over the world. This is genocide. This is obliterate all the Jewish people in the face of the earth. Because of this one man did not bow down to him. Now he hates all the Jewish people. Whenever in the Bible racism is mentioned, I will not sugarcoat this. It's evil. A week ago, a black African-American was jogging in Georgia. And he was shot, point dead, just because of his color. In this arbitrary of Ahmed Arbery, shot and killed while jogging in America because of his color. That's racism. It's evil. We hate that. And we know that is the spirit of the enemy. Even in 2,500, even to this point of time, that sometimes you hate people because of the color of their skin or because of their belief or just because you hated them. And it could lead to murder. Now going back to the story of Esther, now it has been revealed. Mordecai, you're a Jew. But remember... King Xerxes didn't know that his wife is Jewish. So now Mordecai, listen to what the Bible says. In the 12th year of King Xerxes, in the first month of month, Nisan, the poor, P-U-R, poor, is what they call the lot. It's like a dice, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And lot fell on the 12th month of the month of Adar. What does it mean? So Mordecai came to King, I'm sorry, Haman came to King Xerxes, hey, I heard some people, they're planning to, to start a rebellion and they want to take you out from your kingdom. It's all lies. The Jewish people didn't even plan that. He, but Haman planned that. And he said, make a decree. You know, back in the day, if a Persian uh, seal is uh, it's, it's irrevocable, if the king put his signet ring, it will be a forever law. So now the law was passed. He used the, the dice, the, they, they just want to throw the dice to know what day they will execute all the Jewish people. I want you to show you a picture of a, of a Purim. This is the Persian Purim. It's like a, a fortune telling. It's like a dice that they roll the dice and it will tell what day, what month. So now time is ticking on the 12th month of month of Adar. You know what's that? That's March. Springtime, they're going to kill all the Jews. Now, here's the problem now. Chapter 4, verse 11 now. We're going. Hang with me, please. All the king's officials and the people of royal provinces know that for any man or woman approach the king in the inner court without being summoned, but it, summoned the king has but one law, that they may be put to death unless king extended his gold scepter to them and spare their lives. What does it mean? You cannot appear in the presence of the king without being invited. Especially in the inner court. If you showed up in the inner court and you're invited, if the king will not stretch the scepter, you die. If the king stretch the scepter, that's amnesty. You get to live. So here comes Hadassah, Esther. Mordecai told him, you must do something, girl. There's a reason why God put you in that position. I want you to go to your husband in behalf of your countrymen. We're all going to die. There's already an execution date for us. And that's why Hadassah was saying, I cannot do it, uncle. If I show up into the inner court, I'm not invited by my husband, I'll be killed. But then and then, Esther had a heart for, his, for her people. And he to, she told her uncle, her uncle, okay, I will appear in the presence of the king. But I want you to go fast for three days. All of the Jewish people in the city of Susa, no food, 
no water, dry fast. For, pass for Esther so that when I appear before the king, I will get favor. That is a wise woman. Esther did not settle for quick fix, but for a fast fix. Church, let's have a fast fix for our nation. What will fix this coronavirus is not just the scientists, it's not the White House, it's not just the, the government. They don't know the answer. They don't have the solution. Why don't we call on the God and call upon the name of God? When they were back against the wall, Esther knew she might die if going to the presence of the king. She said, I don't want a quick fix. Let's have a fast fix. Three days, let's fast. Look at what the Bible says. Esther 4.16 says, Then Esther sent his reply to Mordecai. That's the uncle. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my attendant will fast as you do. And this is what Esther said. When this is done, I will go to the king. Even though it's against the law. If I perish, I perish. That's an all-weather faith. If I die, I die. In Tagalog, patay kung patay. You know, how many of you have heard this true story in New York? There were protesters. What they did, they bought Barbie dolls and G.I. Joe. Stay there. I will explain you the background. They're protesting and they used the toys as their as their point of uh, protesting, you know what they did? You know, if you buy Barbie dolls, talking Barbie dolls and talking G.I. Joe, the famous line of Barbie, what? Let's shop till it drop. And G.I. Joe, attack, attack. I said, don't go there yet. <laughs> and so what happened is they took out the boys' boxes from the 1,000 toys and they switch it. So imagine all of the kids, they bought a Barbie doll. And Barbie doll said, attack, attack. And then they bought G.I. Joe, let's shop till they drop. True story. That is like Esther. She is not just a Barbie doll. She is like G.I. Jane. Attack, attack. If I perish, I perish. Now, let me tell you this. We are all in crisis, all of us. You know, crisis doesn't create character. It reveals it. If you have a problem in your marriage, and then it happened during the coronavirus, you already have a problem in your marriage. The coronavirus just amplify it. If you have a problem with substance abuse, with alcoholism, the coronavirus just exposed it. It's already a problem. So all of us today, our true colors are being revealed by this character. When come hell or high water in the life of Hadassah, she cannot deny it anymore. I am a Jew living in Persia. And my heart is for the people of God. And I can't deny it. I am a Jewish woman. And I'm going to reveal my true colors. And now in chapter 5, imagine this. Esther went inside the inner court in front of all the nobles and officials without being invited. Look at this. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the place. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, God moving behind the scene, instead of being mad, he was pleased with her and held out her gold scepter that was innocent. Remember this, the king who killed 
his first wife, Queen Vashti, just because the, the wife said no. And this girl barts in into the inner court in the meetings with the nobles and the officials. But God was moving behind the scene. He softened the heart of this king. And he extended the scepter. It's like a long scepter. It's like this. And Hadassah or Esther touched the scepter. Instead of death, now she gets favor. And the king said, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to the half of the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asked. What? The king is now listening to the wife and obeying the wife? Talk about the power of a woman. Hear a woman, hear me roar. Right? A woman's power. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. So imagine you're Haman. You receive an invite. There will be a party. This time it's just King Xerxes, Queen Esther, and Haman. This guy is ego maniac dude, right? What I was thinking, oh my gosh, finally they recognize how good I am. Finally they recognize who I am. Maybe the more he became a prideful and listened to what he said. And that's not all Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she was invited me along with the king. So when he went out of the king's palace... He saw again Mordecai, and Mordecai did not bow down to King or to, to Haman. And once again, Haman was so mad, he went home and complained to the wife. You know your, your husband, wife, you know what I'm talking about? When a husband is mad at that person and tell the person to that wife, both of you are mad at that person, right? <laughs> both of you are plotting. And so the wife said, Okay, if you're really mad at that guy, why don't you make a gallows 70 feet high and hang Haman over there? And you could do it. You have a lot of influence with king. Tell them that that's your request. That's the plan of the woman. This woman is a really an, is evil wife. Listen to what you said. Her name is Seresh. Well suggested Seresh's wife and all his friends get a ready of 70 foot high gallows in the morning and ask the king to let you hang Mordecai on it. And when this is done, you can go on your merry way. And the king, with the king to the banquet, that pleased Haman immensely, and he ordered the gallows built. So, but imagine this. God is moving behind the scene. If in Seattle, there is what we call the sleepless in Seattle, this is the first edition of sleepless in Susa. Look at this, the sleepless in Susa. That night... The king could not go to sleep. The most powerful man in the world could not go to sleep. Listen to this, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This is before the party. The night that king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the chronicles recorded of his reign to be brought and read to him. Back in that day, there's no Netflix. He cannot binge watch. So he said, I can open the diary, open the, the chronicles, and read about my, my, my reign, my rulership. And it was found recorded there, listen to this, Mordecai had exposed the king's officer who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. There was a time Mordecai heard somebody is plotting to kill the king and he exposed the king's officer. And King Xerxes forgot that. And then he said, what did we do for Mordecai? You saved me. Oh, we didn't do anything for him. Really? We didn't do anything for this man who, who, who exposed the, 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 the connivance or the, the conspiracy inside my kingdom? And so, okay, I don't know what to do. And then here comes Haman. Imagine Haman thought that there will be an honor for him because he's the only one invited. And, and the king said, I have a problem. We found out that there's someone who plotted to kill against me and someone exposed the secrecy or the conspiracy against me. What should we do? 
to that man. Of course, Haman was thinking about himself. He will be honored because he's the man. Oh, king, why don't you do this? Let this man ride on your horse. Let him wear your robe. And let it be paraded into the kingdom of Zuza. This is the man. He was thinking about himself. So here's the thing. And then <laughs> King Cersei said, that's what we're going to do to Mordecai. <laughs> and imagine this. The hater, the one who hated Mordecai, was the one <laughs> pulling the rope of the horse. Go, go just imagine, check this out. Look at this picture. Look at this. Can we show it on the screen? Look at this picture. Could you imagine it's moping and, 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 and mad, right? Imagine. Church, listen to me carefully. Don't act on your behalf. Let God act on your behalf. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Those haters don't hate them. Just keep loving them and keep serving Jesus and keep growing and keep achieving because one of these days, those haters will be your celebrator. They'll be the one pulling the rope. <laughs> Here's the man. <laughs> That's what happened. It's so funny. And now, here's the, uh, now the dinner happened. Only Haman, only Queen Esther, and King Cerses. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your eyes, O king, and it please the king, please give me my life and give my people their lives. You know what he's saying? I am a Jewish lady. And there is a decree. You said on that day, all the Jews will be killed. Your wife is Jewish. Wow. Listen to what Esther said. We've been sold, I and many people, to be destroyed, sold to be massacred, eliminated. And now King Cyrus exploded. Who? Where is he? This bastard. And Esther replied, this wicked Haman, only three of them, is our adversary. And our enemy, and Haman grew pale with fright before the king and the queen. If you look at this picture, this is like what happened. Imagine Queen Esther pointing. This is the man who wanted to kill your wife and all my people. And you know what happened? He was digging the grave for Mordecai. It was his own grave. Haman was hanged. 70 feet high on that gallows he built for Mordecai. Where is God? God is moving behind the scene. What happened after that? The city of Susa exploded with joy. For Jews, it was all sunshine and laughter. They celebrated they were honored. It was that way all over the country. The Jews took to the streets, celebration, cheering, and feasting. What's the point, church? Listen to me carefully. God can turn a day of evil into a victory and celebration. Come on, somebody. Yes, the dice has been rolled. The devil... Among with the cohorts of the demons, rolling the dice. Let's roll the coronavirus in the world. Let's kill them all. Let them be infected by this sickness. And because of this virus, fear, pandemic will go all over the world. Let's shut down the building of the church. The dice have been rolled. But don't you ever forget, God is still sitting in the throne. Yes, the building is closed. But it's now the homes all over the world are open to the gospel. Check this out. This is the Purim, right? It's like a dice that's been rolled. But here's the bottom line. The future of God's people will never be determined by the roll of the dice. The future of our, us, God's people, will never be determined by chance. That's why we don't believe in horoscope. Will not be determined by fortune telling. 
God has a plan. God has a promise. God has a purpose. And you know now, it's now part of the feast in Israel. It's called the Feast of Purim. If you go to Israel during springtime, of course, to this year is canceled. But ever since then, after this, that is the feast that they party in Israel. The feast of Passover is quiet because Jesus is being crucified. But the party festival is like a Mardi Gras in Israel. It's called the celebration of God's deliverance in honor of Queen Esther. You know how they greet happy Purim. The word that was used to kill them, they turn it into a happy occasion. Church, this is an, an instrument of death back in the day. Nobody wears a cross necklace back in the day because it's an instrument of death. God, God turned this cross, an instrument of death, into a point of victory. Jesus won. He is alive. What I'm trying to say to all of us, yes, we're suffering during this coronavirus, but check me, I'm just suggesting this. A few years from now, we will have a celebration. We will call it Happy Corona. We will be parading in the street. We survive. We are alive. And look at those babies. The coronials are marching. <laughs> you know, during the happy Purim, it's like the Mardi Gras or the Halloween in Israel. They wear masks. You know, I asked a friend of mine who's a, a rabbi there. Why do they wear masks? Even the kids in the street of Israel. Because you know what we're celebrating? We remember the time when we thought God has forgotten us. But we didn't know he's just wearing a mask. He was moving behind the scene. And if you go there, here's part of their celebration. Because now, because of time, now they wear all kinds of costume. Look at this. And they're parting on the street. Let me show it on the screen, please. Can we show it on the screen? Here is what they, they celebrate. You know what's this? They call it Haman Tashian. A baked cookie. And the shape is like the ear. Because they call it the ear of Haman. <laughs> the guy who was trying to kill us. We will honor you. We will make a cookie in honor of your name. It's called Haman Tashin. Look at this picture. I just want to show you. Look at this. This is happening there. People are celebrating in the Feast of Purim. Check this out. There's all kinds of uh, costume that they're wearing during this time called the Feast of Purim. This is what I like the most. These are the ladies in Israel marching and waving and all of this. Because... They remember 2,500 years ago, there's a plot to kill us, to wipe us in the face of the earth. But God moved behind the scene in the person of an orphan girl named Hadassah, also known as Esther. Three life lessons I want to leave to all of us today. There's a purpose, there's a providence, there's a promise. We have to realize, church, while we're suffering during this coronavirus all over the world, God allowed it because he has a purpose. Listen to what Mordecai said to Hadassah Esther. Who knows, but that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. If you are alive during this corona pandemic virus, who knows? You are in this season for such a time like this. Have you ever thought of this? You could have been born during the early 1900s, but God chose you to be alive during this season of pandemic because God has a purpose for your life for such a time as this. You know what Mordecai is saying? Hey girl, the reason why God made you beautiful, the most beautiful woman in the face of the earth, is not to take a selfie that you are Miss Persia. God made you beautiful because God will use you to save your people. God has a plan. 
He has a purpose for such a time like this. That's why I want to say to all of us, church, we are alive. We have a destiny. Let's make this our best year ever for such a time like this. I want to speak this over you right now. God has you right where you are right now for such a time like this. And let me be personal to all of you watching online or hearing at the sound of my voice. God has you in your neighborhood. In your apartment, in your job, for such a time like this. For such a time like this, God chose me to be one of your pastors in this season. And my heart is breaking, looking, and missing all of you. That's why last week, as a rough week for me, I was crying to God right here in the building. And the Lord just gave me an idea. If we cannot gather in the building, let's gather in the parking lot. Let's have a drive through Mother's Day. The moment I saw those cars coming inside the parking lot, I teared up and I cried. And one lady came, a friend of our member, for such a time like this. She was about to give up, single mom, feeling so sorry for herself. One of the members said, come to our church. We're going to have a drive through Maybe you could get some food, flowers. She drove by. The moment when she received the flowers from Pastor Ariel Lani, and the moment she was prayed for, this is what she said. She just texted, it was put in my Facebook, and she said, thank you so much, Charisma, for the Mother's Day blessing yesterday. You have touched my heart in so many ways. Praying over me and my son really helped things get turned around in my life. Noel Deshida, thank you for inviting me to this and to watch the live stream. Now she's been watching us. I'm a single mom and have been now since I was three months pregnant. Listen to this. Knowing that I am loved and not forgotten really helped me so much. Desiree. Myers, for such a time like this. Charisma, can I just tell this all of us? Yes, let's be safe, let's stay healthy. But please, God did not save us for safety. He saved us to save others. Don't hunker down, go out. Share the love of God. Of course, we're going to be social distancing, but we're going to do this now as we have resources that God has blessed us. This coming June 6, I want you to invite your family and friends. Free grocery on us. Free drive through giveaway. You will be driving and believing for more than 200 bags of grocery already. Allotted 200 bags of grocery. We talked to grocery outlet. This morning, Convoy of Hope called me and said, James, we want you to know we're still on the line. We're waiting for a 10-wheeler Convoy of Hope donation of groceries. In fact, we're going to give away all to the community. We're contacting Chick-fil-A. We're going to buy Chick-fil-A from them. And one Saturday, we'll just have meals on us. For such a time like this, church, when the world is looking for hope, when the world is just looking for something of distraction that will help them out. Church, we cannot do everything, but we can do something. We cannot help everybody, but we can help somebody. Because we live to give and we love to give. For such a time like this, the people of God must arise and spread hope. Realize there is a purpose. Why you are alive today? Why were you born during this pandemic? There are some people that God wants you to take them out of the dark and bring them to the light of Jesus. And remember, God's providence. You know the word providence in Latin? Provideo. Pro means before. Bijo, I see. 
You know what it means? Before this virus happened, God saw it already. And God allowed it. He has a purpose. And in the midst of this, God will provide. God will take care of our needs. The economy of God's people don't depend upon the economy of the land. God has blessed our church. Charisma, I just want to let you know. Now we're overflowing blessing is turning it to outreach to the community because God doesn't want us to be a dead sea. God wants us to be a Jordan River. Let it flow. 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 Church, people might think it's coincidence, but for us believers, we call it providence. Is it coincidence that Queen Vasti is disposed as queen? Out of hundreds of women, Esther is chosen to be queen. Mordecai hears a plot to kill the king and expose it. Haman plots to kill all the Jews. The king one night could, ha could ha have a sleepless night and has his chronicles read to him on and on. Or is our invisible God orchestrating events to bring a mighty deliverance about. Remember this providence. God is at work even when you don't see Him. It's like the cameraman in this presentation. You don't see Him but behind the scene He's orchestrating the move, the presentation of this live stream broadcast charisma while God is out, silent He is not absent you know remember when we're still students going to school we have a test the teacher is just sitting behind the desk and is silent because there is a test going on Sometimes you could ask the teacher for help, but there's silence. But it doesn't mean the, uh, the teacher is absent. We are all in the test right now. But God is here. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's providence. There's a purpose, there's providence, and there's a promise. The problem is sometimes we forget the promise when we go to the test of life. We panic. Can I just say to all of us, God is the God of the blessing. And God is the God of the storm. God is the God of the crisis. God is the God of the hardships. In the time of the blessing, the hardship, the trials, the difficulty in life, God is still there. And He made the promise while you go through this. And sometimes we forget we need to repeat it. Remember, no mention of God in the book of Esther. But before they went through this exile, God made a promise to a prophet. His name is Jeremiah 29, 11. We know all this chap uh, promise. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me and you will seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Did you know that promise was given to the exiles? Jeremiah 29, letters to the exiles. Before they went on their quarantine, they went on that viral pandemic of being persecuted, foreigners in a foreign land. The prophet of God stood and said, this is the plan of God. Yes, he will allow us to be exiled. Yes, he will allow us to, to lose our job. Yes, he will allow us to lose our homes. But I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Church, the most important word in that promise is not the hope, it's not the future, it's not the plans, it's I know. God knows. White House doesn't know it. Scientists don't know it. 
The economists don't know it. The expert don't know it. But God knows. What I'm trying to say is don't doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Yes, we are in the dark right now, but don't forget God has a promise before we go through this dark. And this is us right now walking step by step by faith. It's like a dark tunnel, but we're walking. We're moving on. Sometimes we drop. Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we can't do it anymore, but keep pressing on. We're going to go through this. And I believe God has a word for me to say to you today. I just want to speak this over you. This is my prophecy to you from the Lord. No matter where you are, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how worse the situation, no matter what people plotting against you, I, your God, will manifest my presence, my power among my people. Back in the day, they rolled the dice to kill the Jews. But God intervened because the future of God's people is not determined by the roll of the dice. The devil rolled the dice of coronavirus, wanted to kill us. I want you to know, God has a promise. Will never forsake us. He will not abandon us. That's why I want Pastor Richard to help me out to come. I want you to sing this by faith. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna worship my way through. Can we show it on the screen? This battle, gonna worship my way through. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. And I know how the story ends. Yes, I know how the story ends. Because we have the proof, the cross. I want you to stand up on your feet right now, wherever you are. Arise and shine in the midst of sickness, in the midst of your pain. I want you to sing this by faith that we're gonna see a victory. God is moving behind the scene. He will never leave us nor forsake us. The weapons may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows all triumph oh my god will never fail oh my god will never fail i'm gonna see you Thank you. 
begun Yes, you turn it for good You take what the enemies meant for evil And then you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good Sing it away silence of God doesn't mean the absence of God. Providence, God moving behind the scene, but He is orchestrating everything. For such a time like this, you are living in a moment that God has a purpose. For such a time like this, not to play it safe, but to go out 
and save others and tell them there's a living hope it's not a pill that you swallow it's not a program that you join it's not a philosophy that you think of it's a person his name is Jesus Christ he is alive the cross says it all that there is hope there is victory there is forgiveness there is healing there is restoration you will look back a few years from now and celebrate the victory of how God provided for you, for us during this virus, this pandemic, how the Lord carried us through to the other side because of Jesus. And the hero is God, but He is just behind the scene. He is using people like you and me. Today, I want to give this opportunity for you to know Him. There's a lot of people watching us online. Maybe tonight or this morning is the day that you know Him. Give your life to Him. Accept Him as your Savior and Lord. Just pray this prayer with me. The Bible says, you confess you with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. God will come to you. Say, Dear Jesus, I want to choose to believe that you are here. Even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, but I choose to believe because I know you died for me and you rose from the dead and you are alive. That is the hardest promise to keep and you deliver it. And I know you can deliver your promise during this crisis. Come into my life. Say that from your heart. Come into my life. Forgive me for all my sins. And write my name in the book of life. And from this day forward, I know you are for me, not against me. You're before me. You're beside me. You're behind me. You will all over me and you are for me in Jesus name Amen can we give Jesus a clap of praise today thank you for watching us online